I want you to think for a second about what's the best news that you've ever received. Maybe for you it's, I finally got the job, or that I was declared cancer free, or that I finally got the acceptance letter, or that the Lions won again. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I want you to think about though, what's, what's the best news that you've ever received? At the top of my list, near the top of the list for me, was when my wife shared with me that we were pregnant with our first son. Now, I'm gonna share with you a video. I'm entrusting this video to you, okay? And I wanna set this up a little bit. Because my wife had prepared to surprise me when I, when I came home and I missed all of the cues. She literally blacked out the windows of our front door, missed that entirely. She hung Christmas lights all throughout the living room, had no idea. She literally hung three shirts on the back window. It said Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear, no clue. And right at the entrance, there was a pregnancy test. <laughs> Missed all of it. <laughs> so you're gonna see me slowly come online to what was happening, and then you're gonna hear the pitch of my voice continue to climb. Let's take a look. Blacked out windows, no clue. Hey. Hi. What's up? Dinner was not the surprise. No? What is this all about? <laughs> We're having a baby. Nuh uh. Yeah? No. <laughs> no. What? I just keep saying oh, no seriously? a bunch. Yeah. Which is not no. good. No. Stop. For real? Yeah. You wouldn't lie about this, no. would you? <laughs> You're serious? I've known for like a week. No. No. Just full falsetto at the end there. One of the greatest days of my life, though. Some of the best news I have ever received. Good news has a way of breaking into our lives and rewriting the narrative entirely. But here's the catch. As wonderful as those moments are, we all know that they don't last forever. Joy sometimes feels like it's just sand slipping through our fingers. Advent reminds us, though, of a different kind of joy. One that doesn't depend on circumstances, but most certainly does change our realities. It's found in the announcement of the angels to the shepherds in Luke chapter two, which says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this wasn't just any news. This is the best news the world had ever heard and it was proclaimed not to kings or priests, but to shepherds, ordinary people living on the margins of society. So today we wanna to unpack what this announcement means, not only then, but for us today and how we can leave from here and live in this great joy. Now, depending on your translation, the word joy, rejoice, or joyful shows up something like 430 times throughout the Bible. Like it's a really important, significant theme. So, so why do we struggle to really experience joy? Uh, at least two reasons. One reason is I think we often confuse it with happiness. Happiness depends on what's happening around us, but joy, joy runs much deeper. She, she hates when I do this, but Rachel's on our teaching team and she just like laid this on us in teaching team. She said, happiness is like a candle that flickers in the wind. Joy is like a lighthouse steadfast in the storm. That'll preach. Have I mentioned how grateful I am for our teaching team? Another reason that I think we struggle to experience joy is fear. If we're honest, much of our life is shaped by fear. Fear of failure, fear of the unknown, maybe fear of not being enough. Fear shrinks our world, steals our peace, and crowds out our joy. Anyone know what I'm talking about today? The angel's announcement in Luke 2 confronts both of these barriers, and it reveals this, that joy isn't something we achieve, it's something we receive. And that's very, very good news. It's not a ladder that we climb or a badge that we wear, it's something that we simply receive. It's not dependent on what we do, it's rooted in what God has done. So I wanna, I wanna read the entire passage again and then we're gonna kinda march through it together if that's all right. Luke chapter two, we'll start in verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, 
Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Now, this is the only time, by the way, in Luke's gospel that the phrase, the glory of the Lord, uh, appears. It signifies God's presence breaking into the ordinary. So I actually want to spend the bulk of our time just on, on one verse in this section, because I think it's just absolutely packed with meaning for us today. It's verse 10. Let me just read it again. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So let's Let's unpack that. The first part is do not be afraid. Joy begins when we learn to release fear. The shepherd's fear, I would argue, is a natural response to a divine encounter. Throughout scripture, when humans encounter the glory of God, fear often follows. The angel's first words address what is a reasonable first reaction. This is a reasonable response. Have you seen some of those, like some of our like cartoon depictions of angels, I think fall way short. Have you seen, there's been a recent rise in like animations and illustrations of biblically accurate angels. For example, here's one of a biblically accurate depiction of an angel. Does anyone else think terror is a reasonable response? Can you imagine that popping out of nowhere and be like, do not be afraid. You're like, forgive me, but you're the scariest thing I've ever seen (laughs) in my entire life. Now, this fear also made sense because the shepherds were living in a time of Roman occupation, economic uncertainty, and religious oppression. Can we get that off the screen? I'm so sorry. It is freaking me out. Just, okay, great. (laughs) So they're living in a time of Roman occupation, economic certainty, uncertainty, and religious oppression, and now their night is interrupted by the radiant glory of the Lord. Have you ever been interrupted with light when you were in a dark place? Again, I'm gonna share a story with you and I'm trusting you with this information. So before I was fully sanctified in my high school years, I did a lot of bad things. Okay. (laughs) Sarcasm was really thick on that one. uh, One of the things we used to do that I can at least share here is that we used to uh, trespass into a trestle bridge and we would jump off of this bridge into a, uh, a body of water underneath it. It was like our like sort of fun activity. We would bring people and it was definitely trespassing. So we would do it late at night. And we had not done this so many times that we were comfortable with it. It made it all kind of really scary because you couldn't actually see the water when you were jumping from the bridge. And so we were there one night and then all of a sudden the glory of the Metro Detroit police shone around us. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> We were terrified. (laughs) But I want you to notice the angel doesn't tell them to stop being afraid and just leave it at that. He gives them a reason and the reason is good news. I would say it like this, that joy begins when we realize that fear doesn't have the final word. Joy begins when we realize that fear does not have the final word. My uh, my friend Aubrey Sampson uh, wrote this brilliant book on lament called The Louder Song. And she describes, she tells this story when she was in a season of great grief. And she had gone to a concert. And uh, what began was at the stage, they were singing this like really heavy, sad dirge. And it was just like the whole room could feel it. And then suddenly a choir emerged from all of the exits and began like walking in on them, singing an entirely different song, a song of hope and a song of peace and a song of Joy, And she describes this experience where all of a sudden, like, the dirge didn't stop going, but she was now listening to a much louder song, a song of hope, a song of peace. I would ask us, church, what song are you listening to in this season? Is it a song of despair or is it a song of hope? Paul echoes this truth when he writes in Philippians 4. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. He's saying, listen, there's going to be things that are going to weigh in on us that will sing a darker song. But joy begins when we realize that fear doesn't have the final word. I would say it like this. The command, do not be afraid, isn't just a command. It's an invitation. The angel is calming their fears so that they can receive the joyful message. Like the shepherds, we are invited to replace fear with trust, knowing that God is near. The next is, uh, I bring you good news. I bring you good news. Joy is grounded in the gospel. The angel's announcement isn't a, a vague statement or a motivational speech. It's good news. The Greek word here is euangelion. Let me just say euangelion. 
Evangelion is the word where we get gospel. It's a life-altering proclamation that a savior has come. This actually initially was a military term. If a battle was won far from kind of the home base, they would send someone ahead that they called an evangelist to proclaim back to the city that the battle had been won. That's what we declare when we declare good news. It's not a good idea or a good philosophy or good insight. It's good news that the, the battle has been won. So what is this good news? It's that God has come near in the person of Jesus, born to reconcile us to himself, to bring peace to our broken world and to restore what has been lost. This news is it's temporary or conditional. It is eternal and unshakable. Imagine that you're drowning and someone throws you a life preserver. I think most of us would agree. That's good news, right? Thanks for the life preserver. But now imagine if the person who saved you then pulls you to shore, tends to your wounds, and offers you an entirely new life. That is the kind of news that the angel is announcing. A rescue that is not simply temporary, but transforms every part of our existence. This kind of joy flows from the confidence that the gospel is true, that God's promises are trustworthy, and that his love is relentless. That's the kind of good news that they're talking about. And then we see the phrase, great joy. Joy transforms us from the inside out. Notice the angel doesn't just promise joy. He promises great joy. This isn't fleeting happiness, but a deep abiding joy that reorients our life. To offer another metaphor, think about a tree in winter. Typically a tree in winter, its branches are bare And to the world around it, that may even seem lifeless, but beneath the surface, its roots are drawing strength deep from within the soil. That's what joy does in our lives. It sustains us even in the harshest seasons. Even when we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because it's rooted not in circumstances, but in Jesus. The harshest seasons can't shake the joy that draws strength from unseen roots. Joy isn't just about the season we're in, it's about the soil that we are planted in. Circumstances may strip our branches, but joy grows from the soil of God's faithfulness. And the winter will reveal where our roots really are. When winter comes, we will see what we are actually rooted in. Is it our circumstances? Is it our 401k? Is it our platform or success? Or is it something greater? Again, Paul reminds us to think about whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Cultivating joy isn't accidental. It requires intentionality and focus. And here's the truth that I've found is that we can't evade pain, that's inevitable. You can evade joy. And I wanna say to us today that what happens to us does not have to define what happens in us. Joy is a choice, it's about choosing to dwell on God's goodness even when life feels overwhelming. To dwell on God's goodness means to intentionally turn our thoughts towards his faithfulness, love, and provision, especially in the ordinary mundane moments of our life. It's choosing to focus on what God has done, what he's doing, and what he has promised to do. Practically, this could look like each day by naming three ways that you've seen his goodness recently. Meditating on scripture that reveal his character, or even just hitting pause a couple of times every day just to thank God for his goodness. I think by practicing gratitude and reflection, we begin to train our hearts to rest in his goodness, even when life feels painful, even when it feels uncertain. I think it's interesting that it was for joy that Jesus endured the cross. Hebrews 12 says it this way, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he was able to endure even the cross. What might that do in our lives? To fix our eyes, not on just our circumstances, but on Jesus. And then we see the phrase, for all the people. For all the people. Translation, uh, joy isn't a gated community. 
It's not for the elite. The angel's message is actually radically inclusive that this good news is for everyone. This story unfolds on the outskirts of Bethlehem where the shepherds are tending to their flocks at night. In fact, the shepherds were probably the least likely people to be invited into the story. Uh, in first century Judea, shepherds were peasants located toward the bottom of the scale of power and privilege. The life of a shepherd was not an easy one. It required long hours, late nights and early mornings protecting their flocks from wild animals. Sometimes they would even have to carry a sheep if it was injured or unable to walk. These were hardworking people who did the kind of work that no one else wanted to do. But in first century Israel, shepherds were also seen as outcasts, often lumped in with bandits and tax collectors. They represented not only the ordinary, but the marginalized. Some scholars tell us that people back then believed that shepherds were in cahoots with the crooked stuff going on in the temple in that day. The religious establishment would sell sheep at an outrageous price to people who didn't have one to sacrifice when they came to the temple. It's sort of like, you know when you go to the airport and you wanna buy a sandwich that anywhere else would cost $3? but for some reason at the gate, it's 47.50. <laughs> it's like that times a million. And so the shepherds didn't have a great reputation. They themselves were also not allowed to worship in the temple or the synagogue because their occupation, working closely with animals, left them unclean and unacceptable according to religious standards of their day. So at best, at best, shepherds were considered to be second-class citizens. Now, I, I hesitate to mention what group of people we would consider to be modern day equivalent of the shepherd. And I know this isn't politically correct, but after a lot of research, a lot of thorough study, most scholars agree that if the angels were to appear to the very lowest of the low today, they would appear to a group called Kansas City Chiefs fans. <laughs> Do you understand now how shocking it was <laughs> that the angels would appear even to them? I was gonna say Packers, but I changed it. I just, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> but if something like this were to happen today, we would question the messenger. And we would likely question the message as well. In fact, I'm guessing the shepherds themselves had to have been thinking like, Who, us? Did you get the wrong address? How, how in the world could you be entrusting this message to us? Maybe you feel that way today. Who, who am I? How could this be happening to us? They were the last people on earth anyone would have thought God would appear to, let alone invite to come and see the most important occurrence in the history of the world. But here's, here's the remarkable thing. And I don't want to belabor this point, but I think, it's, I think it's significant for us today. It is to these shepherds, not to kings or priests, that the first announcement of Jesus' birth is given. This reflects a theme that runs all throughout the Gospels, that God's kingdom is for the lowly and the humble and those on the margins. And even better yet, this good news isn't just for the lowly, it starts with them. It's not just, yeah, we'll let you be included. It begins with them. When the rest of the world says, hard pass, no thank you, God says, those are my people. I'm gonna start with them. It's a reminder that the good news of Jesus is not reserved for the powerful or the perfect, but for everyone. Egyptian, Greek, and Roman God spoke mainly through kings and pharaohs, but this God, this king is different. If you've ever wondered if God cares for everyone, this verse is for you. The expanse of his grace is scandalously wise. Have you ever wondered why the first announcement from an angel is to some random shepherds out in a field that have no connection with Mary or Joseph? It seems random until we realize that this is exactly the kind of thing that we see God do over and over and over again. It underscores a significant theme throughout the entire Bible, that God specializes in using the unqualified and overlooked for his purposes. And remember that Luke says an angel of the Lord appeared to them. They weren't just bystanders. They weren't just spectators. They weren't just witnesses of an event that happened in front of them. The angel went to them specifically. To those who feel like outcasts, if you feel overlooked, not worthy of God's attention or affection, this story punctuates that God doesn't simply come to us, but he comes to you. He is mindful of you. He is interested in you. To those who feel this way, the story is for us. When God could have appeared to anyone, he doesn't appear to kings or priests, but to shepherds. He draws near to the overlooked 
and the marginalized. That's a really, really big deal. The gospel breaks down every barrier of exclusion and invites everyone in, no matter their background or their story, into the joy of knowing Jesus. Now, this also shows that joy is not a limited resource. It's not like, here's a little bit for you. It's not rationed. It's not reserved for a couple of people. I would say like this, that joy doesn't compete for space. It creates more of it. It grows the more that you give it away. This Advent, we're reminded that joy isn't just something that we receive gratefully. It's also something that we share. Think about laughter. Have you been around someone with like a weird laugh? (laughs) Point to them if they're in the room. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Even if like you didn't find the joke funny at all, Have you noticed that if they're laughing, eventually you're laughing? There's a a French TV show that invited like a number of people with really wild laughs and it just like dominoes into each other. And uh, I want to dare you not to laugh during this 40 second clip. Take a look. (laughs) You're celibataire, it's not because of your laughter. I hope not. No. I can watch that for an hour straight and be just fine. (laughs) Now the thing about laughter, laughter is beautiful. It bonds us to one another. We always laugh more when we're with others. When we see something funny online, that's why we instinctively reach for the share button. The shepherds didn't just keep the good news of great joy to themselves. They spread the word and everyone heard it, who heard it was amazed. Now verse 11 gives us the specific reason for this joy. Verse 11 again says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Real briefly, uh, five Phrases or words that I think are are massively significant in that one sentence. Today, the timing emphasizes immediacy. The long-awaited Messiah isn't coming someday. He's here now. Like, who you've been waiting for is here. The town of David, this links Jesus to King David fulfilling Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah's lineage. A savior, this title highlights Jesus' role as the one who will rescue humanity from sin and death. The Messiah, also translated as the Christ, this affirms Jesus as the anointed one, the fulfillment of God's promises. And then the Lord, this title elevates Jesus beyond human kingship, identifying him as divine. Today, the town of David, a savior, the Messiah, the Lord. Those hearing this, would have understood the weight and the gravity of what was being spoken over them. And then we see in verse 12, the angel provides a sign to confirm the message. It says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. You might be asking like, okay, well, how is that a sign? That doesn't seem all that significant. I think this small detail again shows us what God is like. It's shocking enough, and it's easy for us to miss this, particularly in the Christmas season, that God would take on human skin. It's even more absurd that that God would then be placed in a feeding trough. A manger is embarrassingly lowly, yet cloth in a manger are exactly the kinds of things that would make up Jesus' ministry. In fact, as far as I can tell in scripture, Jesus is wrapped three times. In a manger, washing feet, and to be buried. Presence, service, sacrifice. This is the glimpse of God that we are given in this baby wrapped in cloth. This sign is striking in its simplicity. The Messiah, the savior of the world, is not to be found in a palace or a temple, but in a feeding trough in a manger. We, we tend to lose sight of just how scandalous this is. But I imagine maybe even the shepherds were skeptical. What, what kind of God does that? Is such a king worthy of our devotion? But a king that can be found in a manger gives hope to the lowly. Who is God that he would step down from eternity and enter broken humanity for us to put
put on human flesh. The truth is, God didn't put on human, gods normally don't put on human skin. Kings have no place in mangers. Saviors don't get nailed to crosses. But this God, this king, and this savior does. This is why we have hope. This is why we have joy. This underscores the humility of Jesus' birth and the accessibility of his kingdom. The shepherds who might have felt out of place in a royal court are invited to approach the Messiah without fear or hesitation. So what do we, what do, we do with that then? How, how do we today actually step into this joy? Let's take the cue from the angel's announcement. Let me just offer a, a couple of responses for us. Number one, uh, let go of fear. Let go of fear. Corey on our teaching team just laid this one on us. He says, put your fear next to God and watch it grow small. That'll preach. Letting go of fear isn't about ignoring the storms. It's about trusting the one who calms them. God's perfect love doesn't negotiate with fear. It casts them out. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the refusal to be ruled by it. I once heard someone say that fear is a liar that is running out of breath. I think that's true. Now, do not fear is arguably the most common command in scripture. I've, I've heard people say that there's uh, arguably 365 declarations of do not fear, one for every day of the year. But I want you to note something, that when God says fear not, his reason isn't because fear is stupid. He doesn't say hey, fear not because that's just not rational. Or fear not, why are you being so foolish? More often than not, the scriptures say, fear not, for I am with you. It's not just a declaration to not fear. We ultimately have nothing to fear, not because situations aren't sometimes scary, but because God is with us in the midst of them. God doesn't always offer answers, but he always offers himself. The gift of presence. He doesn't always give explanations, but he always gives himself. That is perfect love. And perfect love, as we read elsewhere, drives out fear. I would say it like this. Letting go of fear isn't about ignoring the storms. It's about trusting the one who calms them. What would it look like for you to hand your fears over to God this Advent season? Maybe it's naming the things that keep you up at night and surrendering them in prayer. There's a great passage in 2 Corinthians 2. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You take captive every thought, anything that when we hear it or feel it or sense it and we go, that doesn't sound like Jesus. That doesn't sound like hope or joy or peace or love. I love the way the message paraphrase reads. It says, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Every thought, every emotion, every impulse. Thief, fear is a thief of joy. Let's not let it rob us anymore. Secondly, I think we should celebrate good news. I think joy grows when we focus on the gospel. What if, what if every day this week in some way you reminded yourself of the truth that Jesus came for you? Lived and died and rose again for you. Read it, write it down, speak it aloud, Share it with others, remind them, attach this practice to something you're already doing. What if at every dinner time, lunchtime, breakfast, while brushing your teeth, during your commute, during a workout, whatever it is, decide right now, man, every time I do this this week, I'm gonna remind myself of God's goodness to me. The human brain can actually form new neural pathways through intentionally repeated thoughts. Let, let this actually shape your perspective. If you want a good place to start, I would encourage you just to write this verse out every single day, Galatians 2.20. It's so simple and so beautiful. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What if, what if we began every single day reminding ourselves and each other of this truth? Would that, would that change the way that we interact with the server that drove us nuts or that coworker that just stomps on our last nerve or when something doesn't quite go our way or we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? If we just reminded ourselves and each other of that truth. Number three, share your joy. Share your joy. Joy multiplies in community. Who in your life needs to hear good news right now? 
It could be a neighbor or a coworker or a family member. Like the shepherds, we're invited to let our joy spill over into the lives of those around us. A little later in verse 17, it says this, and when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. This, this is why we've been so captivated by this vision of bringing the gospel to every table. Because these shepherds had an up close and personal encounter with Jesus, and then they ran off to be everyday missionaries in their context. No formal experience or resume. They encountered Jesus and they went and told everybody. And how do people respond? Amazement. We likewise, as a church, want to foster encounters with Jesus and see each other as commissioned to live as sent people wherever you live, work, and play, to sit at every table and always pray, Lord, at this table as it is in heaven. God, you invited me to your table. Who needs to be at mine? Every cup of coffee, every conversation, every meal. Lord, help me to help my joy to spill over to this person. That is at the center of our vision behind every table, to provide spaces and resources to equip us to live as everyday missionaries wherever God has us. The fact that these outcasts were among the first to proclaim the good news is both surprising and beautifully dignifying. But it's also an invitation to decidedly declare that you're inviting those to the table. Imagine if we became a church known for this kind of joy, not a a shallow, surface-level, kind of fleeting joy, but a deep, unshakable joy rooted in the good news of Jesus. Imagine if, if people truthfully saw us here at the bridge as strangely unshaken by even the worst kind of news this world can throw at us. Because we're delusional, we've buried our head in the sand, but because we've been so deeply soaked in the good news that God has to offer. Imagine the impact it would have on our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. The angel's message is just as true today as it was that night in Bethlehem. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Church, this Advent, let's not just hear good news. Let's live it. Let's become good news people. Let's share it. Let's let joy transform us from the inside out and let's invite others, wherever they may be, to do the same. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at Bridge Church TN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.